December 15, 1932, Warsaw, Poland. A frost-bitten wind sweeps across the snow-caked courtyard of the Polish Cipher Bureau, rattling the iron gates. Inside, the lamps burn low. Papers, formulas, and teacups crowd the desks of three men who have stayed long past midnight. At the center, Marian Rajewski, 27 years old, leans over a wooden table covered in notes. A quiet man with a mathematician's eyes, always focused, always tracing invisible connections. He's been staring at the same column of numbers for six hours. His hand trembles as he scribbles symbols in pencil, then stops. He knows he's close. Across the room, Jerzy Rojiki pours coffee into a chipped mug, his shirt sleeves rolled up, tie loosened. You're going to burn through the paper before you crack that thing, Marion, he jokes, voice hoarse from smoke and sleepless nights. Rajewski doesn't answer. His eyes dart between the coded sequences, long strings of gibberish intercepted from German military transmissions. Every day, more of them. Every day, the same taunting machine. Enigma. The Cipher Bureau had managed to acquire an early commercial version through espionage. A small, boxy device with three rotating rotors, a plug board, and a keyboard that clicked with cold precision. Each letter pressed on it would light another, seemingly random one. And that randomization changed every single day. It was, to most, mathematical hell. But to Rajewski, it was a riddle. He runs his hand over the top of the Enigma machine, its polished casing cold to the touch. Every code has a rhythm, he murmurs quietly almost to himself. Even chaos hides repetition. He begins writing again, each line a weapon against the machine's arrogance. He's not using cryptography the way others did. Not guesswork, not intuition. He's applying pure mathematics, group theory, permutations, symmetry, concepts so abstract that most military code clerks would never touch them. Rozhitsky glances at the clock. It's nearly three, he says. But Rajevsky doesn't move. He's tracing a loop of patterns, each permutation of rotor positions matching a faintly repeating sequence. Then suddenly, his hand stops. His eyes widen. Wait, he whispers. He pulls a sheet closer, cross-referencing letters, shifts, plugboard swaps. His pencil scratches faster, erasing, writing again, numbers tumbling like dice. Then, the click. Not of a machine, but of logic falling into place. He leans back, heart hammering, eyes fixed on the glowing bulb overhead. He's done it, or almost. For the first time, someone outside Germany understands how Enigma actually transforms letters. How it hides behind mechanical layers of illusion. Jerzy, Henrik, he says quietly, looking up. It's not random. It never was, Rozhitsky blinks, walking over. You're telling me you've... Rajevsky nods slowly. I can see its bones. The room goes silent, except for the low hum of the lamps. Snow falls against the frosted window, like static. In this forgotten corner of Warsaw, three men have just reached into the core of Nazi communication, years before the world would even realize what that meant. Outside, the city sleeps under the heavy weight of winter. Inside, the sound of a pencil scratching against paper is rewriting the history of war. The snow outside the Polish Cipher Bureau thickened that winter, but inside, something extraordinary had begun. January 1933, Warsaw. The air in the Cipher Bureau's main hall carried the smell of ink, tobacco, and machine oil. Under flickering lamps, officers whispered over stacks of intercepted German messages, each one a column of nonsense that no code clerk could make sense of. But in the back room, room 13, as it came to be known, Rajewski, Rozhitsky, and Zygalski 
were building something quietly revolutionary. The Enigma wasn't just a cipher. It was a living thing, one that changed every single day, its three rotors rearranging the alphabet into new patterns at midnight. The Germans believed that no one on Earth could predict those daily settings. And for everyone else, that was true. But Rajewski didn't believe in impossible. He sat hunched over an array of diagrams, the rhythmic clatter of the Enigma keys behind him filling the room. His formula notebook lay open beside him, columns of symbols tracing connections like veins in a living body. He had realized something nobody else had. Enigma's encryption could be expressed mathematically. Each letter substitution was a permutation. Each permutation could be reversed, combined, and analyzed like an equation. It wasn't guesswork anymore. It was algebra. For weeks, Rajewski filled chalkboards with circular mappings of the alphabet, mapping how the machine walked through its letters. Rojitsky handled the intercepted data, charting patterns and frequency clusters. Zagalski, the quietest of them all, checked the logic step by step, searching for the one flaw that could bring the whole thing down. And then, in early February, they found it. A small oversight by the Germans, something no engineer would have noticed. Each morning, Enigma operators sent a three-letter message key, typed twice at the start of every message for verification. It was meant to ensure accuracy, but to a mathematician's eye, it was a golden thread. By comparing those double-typed keys across hundreds of messages, Rajewski saw a pattern emerge. Letters repeating, cycling, mirroring. That was the key. By tracking how the letters transformed in the daily traffic, he could deduce how the machine's rotors were wired inside, without ever opening it. It was genius. It was madness. It worked. Rojiki slammed his mug on the desk when he saw it. You're serious? You can predict it? Rajevsky nodded, exhausted. Not all of it, but enough. Enough to make the impossible fragile. Over the next months, the Polish team constructed something the world had never seen. The first complete mathematical reconstruction of the German Enigma machine. They built a working model, not from stolen parts or captured machines, but from equations. When the replica was first tested in March 1933, the entire cipher bureau gathered in silence. The operator typed a German message that had been intercepted that morning. Each click echoed like a heartbeat. The machine hummed, rotors spinning. Then, one letter lit up, then another, and another. A message appeared. Real words. Real German orders. It had worked. One man, a young mathematician without military rank, had just broken into the Reich's most secret communication system. But there was no applause, no shouting, just quiet disbelief. Rajevsky exhaled, resting his hand on the wooden frame of the machine. He looked more tired than triumphant. They'll change it, he said softly. When they realize it's vulnerable, they'll change everything. He was right. By 1938, the Germans added two new rotors expanding the possible combinations into the tens of billions. Each new update was a tightening of the noose. But Rajevsky and his team refused to stop. They invented new tools, mechanical aids called the Bomba Cryptologichna, the world's first automated code-breaking machine, built entirely in secret Polish workshops. Each Bomba could test thousands of rotor settings per minute, it wasn't perfect, but it was fast enough to stay ahead, barely. The Cypher Bureau became a fortress of intellect, hidden in plain sight, fighting a war no one else knew had begun. Yet outside those walls, Europe was changing. Hitler was rising. Germany was rearming. 
and the Polish mathematicians knew something no one else did. The enemy's words, their orders, their plans. They could see the storm coming long before anyone else. And when it finally broke, they would have to decide what to do with the knowledge they held. And whether the world would even believe them. As Hitler's shadow stretched across Europe, the Cipher Bureau's greatest secret was running out of time. July 24th, 1939. Warsaw. The air was heavy with summer heat and tension. Poland stood between two hungry powers, Germany to the west, the Soviet Union to the east, and every whisper from Berlin said the same thing. Invasion was coming. Inside a nondescript villa at Pyre, a forest clearing just outside Warsaw, a handful of Allied officers gathered around a long wooden table. There were three from Britain's government code and cipher school, three from France's Ducien Bureau, and three Polish mathematicians who looked far too young to be carrying the weight of a continent. I am going to be narrating onwards. Okay. Let's start. Marian Rejewski was there, silent as usual, hands folded on the table. Jerzy Rozitski tapped a pencil against his notebook. Hendrik Zagalski stared at the map of Europe pinned to the wall, borders that felt temporary, like ink not yet dry. The British had come expecting a small briefing, maybe some theoretical progress on German codes. What they got was the truth, and it left them speechless. Colonel Guido Langer, head of the Polish Cipher Bureau, began calmly. Gentlemen, what you are about to see has been the work of six years. We have not only analyzed the enigma, we have rebuilt it. He gestured to a box on the table, covered by a cloth. When he pulled it away, the British officers leaned forward. There it was, the German Enigma machine, but not theirs. This one had been reconstructed from pure mathematics, wire by wire, wheel by wheel. Ryevsky rose quietly and pressed a key. The small bulbs flickered. The machine hummed. He began typing a string of intercepted German text. On the display, coherent words appeared, decrypted in real time. The room fell utterly silent. One of the British delegates, Commander Alistair Denniston, blinked in disbelief. You've... you've... solved it, he said slowly, almost whispering. Good God! Ryevsky didn't smile. We solved yesterday's machine. Tomorrow's may already be different. He turned to the British officer beside him, a thin, quiet man with sharp eyes. His name was Dilly Knox, one of the top codebreakers from Bletchley Park. Knox stared at the Polish replica like a man seeing fire for the first time. I spent months chasing its logic, Knox said, softly. You've done it with paper and pencil. Rejewski's answer was simple. Mathematics is universal, but time is not. The Transfer That day, the Polish team didn't just share their results. They gave everything. Their reconstructed Enigma machines, the wiring diagrams of every rotor, their handmade Zygalski sheets, grids of punched paper used to deduce daily keys, and the blueprints for the Bamba Cryptologica, their mechanical code-breaking device. In one afternoon, Poland handed the Allies the key to the war that hadn't yet started. Wojcicki recorded the serial numbers. Zygalski packed the Z-sheets in brown envelopes. Rozhevsky oversaw the crates being sealed, one by one, each marked with a small red stamp. Top secret, 
to be delivered to GCNCS. None of them knew it yet, but those crates would become the beating heart of Bletchley Park, the foundation for Alan Turing's later breakthroughs, and the secret weapon that would shorten the Second World War by years. The Cost Two months later, on September 1, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. The cipher bureaus scattered. Warsaw burned. And in the chaos, the three mathematicians who had done the impossible became fugitives. Rozhevsky and Zygalski fled south with what little they could carry. Fragments of formulas, a few notes, and the knowledge in their heads. Ruzhitsky would never make it home again. He died when his ship, SS La Mauricière, sank in the Mediterranean in 1942. For years, their names disappeared into silence. Britain never announced what Poland had done. The world credited Bletchley Park and Alan Turing, and indeed, their achievements were monumental. But few ever knew that the first crack in Enigma's armor had come from a cold office in Warsaw six years before. Ruzhevsky lived quietly after the war, never boasting, never bitter. When asked about his work decades later, he simply said, We were mathematicians doing our duty. Others fought with guns. We fought with logic. Legacy. It wasn't until long after his death that the full story came out. The Polish Cipher Bureau's early work had given the Allies a two-year head start in decoding German communications, time that saved convoys, lives, and nations. Without Rajevsky, there would have been no bomb. Without the bomb, no ultra-intelligence. Without ultra, no early warning for the Battle of Britain. No U-boat defeats. No D-Day planning built on decrypted German orders. The world would remember Bletchley Park. But before there was Bletchley, there was Warsaw. Before Alan Turing, there was Marian Rajevsky a man who cracked the code of tyranny before the war had even begun and changed the course of history with nothing but pencil, paper, and brilliance.